excited to be talking about this because this is actually a very important project. Uh, we call it the MoonRap 2. It's a revolutionary portable incubator for water analysis in the field. Um, it's not that hard to make an incubator to do biological cultures, but to make a portable rugged one where you can do things in the field is actually very important because a lot of people's lives depend on it. So moon rat is Texas slang for an opossum. And in the dark, an opossum, which you mostly see in the dark, looks like a gigantic rat. They're unrelated to rats. They're actually... Um, not placental mammals at all. They're the only North American marsupial that remains, which means that the young gestates in the mother's pouch, like a kangaroo, um, which is unusual in North America. Most of the marsupials are in Australia. So it's a little bit of a joke in the sense that the opossum's pouch is a warm place for something to grow. And that's what the moon rat is. Uh, the moon map incubator, which we're building. And the reason we're doing this is because everyday waterborne illness kills 2,000 children less than five years of age, okay? Not every year, but every single day. That's a lot of death that is unnecessary. And if we just had clean water around the world, we could solve that problem. Now, what we're doing today at public invention, our goal is to invent in the public for the public. We're, we're trying to make humanitarian inventions. We're not gonna produce clean water, but an important part of making water clean is knowing when it's dirty and being able to prove when it's clean. So we're tackling an important part of the overall project of providing clean water to every human being on earth. Um, there are many diseases transmitted through water, in particular diarrhea, which kills children more than adults, giardiasis, dysentery, typhoid fever, E. coli infection, salmonellosis. But the big one that's left off this link is cholera. And cholera is also transmitted in this way. And it can, under some circumstances, as it did in Haiti, uh, kill a lot of people. Now, um, Fecal contamination is the best marker for dirty water. Um, this may seem a little weird, but this is, is there's a lot of science behind this. Your water may not have any diseases today, but if it's being contaminated by human feces upstream, it only takes one sick person upstream of you to make an entire village or an entire town sick. Now, the other reason that you use this as a marker is that all warm-blooded creatures have E. coli bacteria in their guts. You, me, everybody in the world has hundreds of millions, if not a billion E. coli bacteria living inside us right now. And they're our friends. They don't hurt us. They're valuable. We're supposed to have them in our guts. They do good things for us. There is a strain of E. coli that occasionally makes the news that causes uh, food poisoning. But that's just one strain of E. coli. Most E. coli um, is valuable. And because it's adapted over, we don't know how many billions of years, to live inside warm-blooded creatures, it's thermophilic. So it needs heat, can't grow in a cold environment. It happens to be a gram-negative facultative anaerobic bacteria that produces CO2. And that's very important for identifying, it, which is one of the things that we're trying to do. Because if you think about um, being in the field, uh, if you go to a village and you're looking at a stream or a well or pond, you have to do a test on the spot and you want to do it quickly. And it's very difficult to tell what microorganisms are in there with the exception of E. coli because E. coli has a very interesting property, and I don't know when this was discovered, more than 40 or 50 years ago. E. coli can consume lactose. Why? Because all mammals drink milk at some point in their life. That's the definition of being a mammal. So if you drink milk it, and you have E. coli in your gut, it makes sense that it can eat lactose. And it happens that it makes an enzyme for the purpose of consuming lactose, 
which happens to cleave a chemical called Xgal. And when it cleaves it in half, this chemical, which is normally invisible, turns into a molecule that looks like indigo. It's not exactly the same as indigo, but it's very, very similar. And it can be seen with the naked eye. And that's extremely important for uh, the work that we're, we're doing here. So I, I do some work, uh, volunteer work for Engineers Without Borders. And Engineers Without Borders goes all over the world trying to solve um, uh, drinking water problems, also agricultural and electrical power problems, but mostly drinking water. And one of the main things they use are Petri films that we'll be talking a lot about more. Now, what you see here are two Petri films that were actually inoculated with a pipette and a drop of water here in Austin, Texas. Um, one of them was from the Turtle Pond at UT and the other was from uh, Barton Springs. Now, um, the little red dots are not bacteria. Bacteria are too small to see with the naked eye. Um, these, are, these are not um, uh, photo, uh, microscopic images. Th these are about three inches across. Each of those is a bacterial colony which has produced a stain, which allows it to be seen by the naked eye and counted. But on the left, you'll see something very interesting. You'll see bacterial colonies, which are blue. That is the indigo color produced by E. coli. Both of these Petri films show a large number, amount of bacteria, but only the one on the left shows the presence of E. coli, which means that it has been contaminated with the feces of a mammal or a bird, but not a fish or turtle, because fish and turtles are cold-blooded and they don't have E. coli in their, their body. So this mechanism makes it easy to count with the naked eye, and it's also very good for communicating on the spot how dirty water is. If you show these two Petri films to someone, even if they, for example, don't understand bacteriology and don't have what we would call germ theory, they can easily see that the water on the left is not safe to drink and the water on the right might be. Now, our ultimate goal is to build a device that you could just point at water anywhere in the world and it would instantly tell you if it was safe to drink. Unfortunately, technology right now doesn't allow us to do that. What we're trying to do, though, is to speed up the process. Now, um, it's interesting that even biologists, there's a certain amount of voodoo involved here in that they can't really count bacteria. What they count are what are called colony forming units or CFUs. Um, and that's the number of colonies that you can see with the naked eye after a certain incubation period. Now, Petri films are very good for proving your water is dirty. But I should point out the World Health Organization requires zero colony colony forming units in 100 milliliters of water. So Petri films, which can only test one milliliter at a time, are not good for proving your water is clean. They're very good for proving your water is dirty, but if your water is clean, you have to use many Petri films to test it. But they only cost $2 each, so they're, they're um, a pretty reasonable approach. Now, because E. coli is thermophilic, it should be incubated at 35 degrees C, plus or minus one degree C for 48 hours. This is close to human body temperature. The chemicals that are in the culture media um, also um, suppress non-thermophilic and non-gram negative bacteria. Otherwise you might get so many bacteria that you would have no, cho no hope of counting it. So what you try to do is to create an environment where the E. coli will grow into colonies that you can count but the other bacteria, which is always present, is suppressed. Um, and because E. coli is thermophilic, that means you have to keep it warm. But like most bacteria, it's actually quite fragile. If you made it too hot, even for just one minute, all the bacteria would die. And then you would be in danger of telling people water was safe to drink when in fact it was not. Now, um, the way Engineers Without Borders has dealt with this in the past is with homemade sort of um, incubators. This is one that we made um, a while ago. Um, it's, it's a big 
system kind of made for keeping a six pack of beer cool. It's quite heavy. Um, and it's easy to build a desktop incubator, but what you really want to do is to make one that's portable that an engineer or a scientist can keep in a backpack more or less easily out in the field where conditions are often very rugged and where most people have access to a little bit of electricity to charge their cell phone, but not reliably. Uh, for example, um, I recently did some volunteer work for Engineers Without Borders in the village of Biharu in Tanzania or Tanzania, and we only had electricity six hours a day in that village. Okay, uh, we reported on this, and this unit that's photographed right here, which we called the armadillo, um, was actually used in Iraq. But Joshua Knight, the engineer who worked on it, said that it was really too heavy, um, even though it was smaller than than practically any incubator that had already been built. And this, this work was published in the Journal of Humanitarian Engineering a, a while back. So when he, he got back from Iraq and told us that it was too big, we decided to make a smaller unit, which we nicknamed the Moon Rat, um, based on uh, trying to make a, a much smaller um, device where the battery pack would be external and perhaps connected with a cable and we could recharge it with a solar panel. And so we started working on the Moon Rat 1 prototype and uh, a woman named Halima Fariola assisted with this and some other people, um, Harshit Kumar um, did some of the 3D design. And as often happens, we started with a simple breadboard design, which you can see on the right. And our plan was to build this bracket, which Harshit designed to keep the incubation chamber, which is typically a thermos bottle that you would keep soup in um, and, and connect it with a bracket to a portable battery power pack, in this case, a lithium ion battery power pack. Um, so eventually this very model was taken to Tanzania where it worked. Um, but we really wanted to do better is, is to make a better version uh, than the one we took to Tanzania, which was hand soldered and hand wired and um, wasn't very robust. Uh, sometimes there's a, a technical term called a rat's nest of wires uh, that were um, connected there. So sometimes the, the term a flying wire is suggested there rather than a printed circuit board, which would be more rugged. And so the idea of the Moon Rat 2 is, is to make the system more modular, rugged, easy to use and easy to reproduce. So um, it is possible that um, public convention will uh, make and sell these units eventually, but everything we do is completely open source. So all of our designs should be, it should be possible for someone else, whether they're an individual or someone want, who wants to make a firm, or for example, someone in a different part of the world who wants to make and distribute these in Africa or Latin America or Asia uh, to make them locally based on our designs. And so it needs to be easy to reproduce. And that means not just having the core electronic designs, but also all of the assembly instructions and, and every, every part of the design so that it can be reproduced. So the first design goal is um, modularity. Now, Engineers Without Borders uses mostly Petri films for doing the kind of water analysis that they do. And that is to determine when water is safe to drink. However, biologists and scientists and doctors may want to culture all kinds of other media, including not just bacteria, but they might want to study yeast, fungi, um, bacteria, even viruses, or um, even to incubate uh, the seeds of vascular plants for example, or a frog spawn. Um, so we want it to be modular enough to accept test tube racks, four inch Petri dishes, five inch Petri dishes, and even stranger uh, situations. So our solution was to separate the control module from the incubation chamber um, so that the incubation chamber geometries can vary. And the, the second design goal is really ruggedness. Um, we want to use 12 volt portable battery packs that are commercial products that are completely off the shelves and have you use no more than two of them for a 48 hour incubation period, which is what the E. coli uh, Petri films require. Uh, it takes about 48 hours to get a good, strong 
um, colony forming unit out of E. coli. Um, and other aspects of ruggedness will be learned through, through testing. So it has to be easy uh, to fit in a backpack. We call this a tote size system because it actually is small enough. It doesn't have to go in a backpack. It can be carried um, in a large bag by hand. And then finally, it needs to be easy to use. Um, so by using a microcontroller, uh, we record the entire temperature history of the incubation cycle. And that allows us to make absolutely sure that we've spent 48 hours not being too hot and not being too cold so that it will be very reliable for biologists and doctors to um, make a determination whether the water is safe to drink, but also for any other scientific purpose that they're uh, interested in. This is a, a strategy that public invention uses. And I, I recommend this as a strategy for everybody. This is fairly typical in the hobby, DIY, do-it-yourself uh, world. And that is to always start with an Arduino Uno and a breadboard. And even though there, there are better microprocessors, an Arduino Uno is just the most plain, vanilla, lowest common denominator system you can do. And you can do a lot with it. It's inexpensive. It's robust. It's simple. Everybody knows it. Um, then we tend to move to a hand-soldered solution. That's what Halima made for us, and that's what we took to um, uh, Tanzania. Some people never learn how to solder, which I think is unfortunate because you can make a very robust system that won't um, fall apart uh, with a hand-soldered solution. Breadboards are very fragile because they, they just have little wires poked in little holes. And so almost any force will pull the wire out of the hole and then it becomes very difficult to figure out uh, what went wrong. But even more robust is to design a printed circuit board which uh, once it's populated with components would be called a printed circuit assembly or a printed circuit wiring assembly. And the ability to make these has gotten much easier, less expensive and faster um, in the last 20 years. So there, there's a standard way of doing this and you can order these parts now from uh, various houses or firms that make them. Some of them are in Asia, but there's some in the United States as, as well. So um, the pricing is typically just based on the size of the board and they're remarkably inexpensive. Once you've made a printed circuit board, although of course the something could go wrong with the printed circuit board and if you put it under tremendous mechanical strain, you could crack it. Uh, they're really much more robust than anything made by hand. And then finally, the last step is to build a rugged enclosure. Um, as soon as you want to take something out of your laboratory and use it in the field, you have to have an enclosure. So you can forget about the enclosure at the beginning of the project, but not for very long, because if you're, if you're going to move fast and be successful, you have to have a rugged enclosure fairly soon. And then finally, at Public Invention, we believe in iteration and going fast by taking baby steps as fast as we can. And so testing is really the center of the design process. What you wanna do is build something as quickly as you can, which is testable. Test it as quickly as you can and then iterate it on your design. So um, we everything we produce is open source, but of course we're lucky. Um, in many ways we're building on the shoulders, standing on the shoulders of giants as Isaac Newton said. We're using free open source tools. They're free of charge and they're also free in the sense that you can look at the code and modify them if you, if you want to, which allow us to do really amazing things compared to what was possible 20 or 30 years ago um, for almost no money um, and with very high quality tools. So the most important of which is the Arduino family itself, which is actually an open source microcontroller family of products. Also valuable is Fritzine and KiCad. Uh, these are schematic capture tools, which allow you to um, input a electronic schematic and then take the further step of turning that into a printed circuit board by doing what's called layout. OpenSCAD is a um, parametric programmable uh, 
computer-aided design tool for making 3D printed parts. FreeCAD is a more powerful tool which can make um, not only 3D printed parts, but also computer controlled um, uh, CNC parts or computer aided manufacturing parts. We have recently used inexpensive worldwide services, JLB, PCB, and other vendors to make these. And also uh, I sometimes order parts from Shapeways uh, 3D printed in many materials. And one of the nice things about Shapeways is that now you can print things in metal uh, although I don't think that will be necessary for, for this project. So um, with some prodding from Melanie, uh, we actually ran a, a crowdsourced campaign here. Earlier this year, we wrote an, an experiment.com proposal to raise money through crowdfunding for their Moonrat 2 project. We successfully secured the full amount to build five incubator prototypes. So you can see there, this is our campaign, the money we, we raised. Um, and it's going to basically be, be dedicated to the enclosure, um, making sure that the PCB was correct and also the control code. Melanie had never designed a printed circuit board before. And, uh, uh, I began by showing her some of the tools for operating KiCad, and I showed her the design of the general purpose alarm device, something that, uh, uh, I had worked on starting last spring, no, spring before. Um, and so Melanie has made schematic symbols. She has wired things up, learned how to generate the bill of materials for it, learned about the importance of understanding vendor part numbers. Um, and this is the schematic for the moon rat. It is similar to the schematic for the hand-built unit, um, but with with more details. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, the, the output from the KiCad uh, uh, system is a bill of materials. That's what you need to buy to assemble stuff, or you need to provide it to your vendor. Uh, parts placement location. These boards, the components are placed by machines, um, and they need to know the X, Y uh, location for components as well as orientation. Um, the actual copper traces are defined by something called artwork, and it's a file that is named after a company, Gerber, that long ago made plotters. As well as there's um, mechanical dimensions that come from the printed circuit board that we will be using as input into our process of designing the enclosure. Next slide, please. So this is Melanie's baby. Melanie designed this printed circuit board. This is a very ambitious first circuit board. Well, actually, Melanie, you, you worked through a few tutorials where you designed a few little baby boards first, right? Yes. All right. Um, describe the two pieces here, Melanie. So you have the controller and you have the heater. The controller is on the left half and the heater is on the right. And what the heater is is mostly connections to a heating pad. But there's one more thing. It's very hard to see. It's very small. And that's U1. And that's actually a, a temperature sensor. So the, the right side of that board, right of that big yellow barrier, uh, will actually be snapped off and that goes inside the incubator uh, chamber and we'll be measuring the temperature uh, there. So it's manufactured as one board, but they do something called a V-cut that lets you snap it apart easily. Next slide, please. One of the things Robert wanted to do was to define an interface between the controller and the possible incubators um, and, uh, because that interface or that connection, uh, is gonna maybe experience a lot of, um, uh, cycles, um, uh, you really want a connector that is rugged and the lower left, uh, set of images is of a connector that is very rugged. Those are meant to connect 
uh, automotive trailer lights together. Um, so I kind of think of them as the default. Um, uh, uh, and, and you buy that sort of thing from auto parts stores uh, here in the United States readily. I assume that things like that are available worldwide. But on the off chance that maybe they are not readily available, we also put in a connector system that uses uh, ribbon cables, which are rather like conventional computer cables. And those are readily available at Amazon. And... Uh, our connection scheme a uh, lot would allow us to either or so that we can, depending upon what is the easiest to procure, uh, we can use either or. The move rack controller and heater boards um, give you a lot of possibilities for different applications and chamber shapes for incubation for a lot of different types of, of samples as well. So basically it's one printed wired assembly to rule them all. Next slide. So we used um, JLCPCB for as many parts as possible to make it simple. And the total cost for five PWAs and um, PCBs, PCB raw boards, was about $205. And that's including the V-cut, the V-score upcharge. And um, yeah, so each of those prototypes is about $50 each. So no. Robert, we Mm -hmm. That prototype price includes the microcontroller that, that is the UNO, essentially. Yes. So Robert wanted me to speak a bit about um, the experience of creating a PCB. So I broke it down to three different um, stages. So you have the tools, which are the electronic fundamentals, um, so concepts like voltage, current, and how current interacts in, in a circuit. Then you got the blueprint, which is like building a house. So you're learning how to place components strategically on a board and route traces. Basically, you want to minimize interference and retain signal integrity, considering trace length. And then you got the build, which is your house. So that's comes from, that's like choosing the right materials to adhere to industry standards. Designing the most beautiful circuit known to man is basically pointless if it's a nightmare to manufacture. So you want to design it with the end in mind so that you don't have constant issues with the manufacturers or else you have to actually scrap the project. So you want to choose proper materials, consider efficient assembly and adhere to industry standards. So basically the road to the Moonrat PCB creation has been joyful and highly frustrating at times, but absolutely rewarding. So thank you so much, Lee. Next slide. In June 2023, the Moonrat team consisted of myself as project manager, Lee as the invention coach, and Robert as the Moonrat one creator. And in November of this year, we um, expanded, welcoming three new amazing team members who are PhD electrical engineering students um, from Guadalajara, Mexico. So Luis, Horacio, and Silvia. Next slide. So we all have different interests and um, focuses, but we all coming together to make this beautiful machine, the incubator. So I am computer science as well as Robert. Lee is a physicist. Sylvia has like, and Horacio and Luis all have different um, focuses when it comes to the one, the, the focus of their PhD. So next step, um, we're going to uh, build the enclosure and and work on the code. So the Guadalajara team is currently seeking off the shelf options for the incubator chamber. And then the code um, is being updated right now. Horacio has actually made some really nice steps tonight. Okay, so next slide. This is the start of an enclosure. Um, uh, I've been designing it in free CAD. And you can see that there's a printed circuit board that's sort of underneath it. That actually was exported from the KiCad. And then I drew uh, sketches, which are two-dimensional drawings that you then apply operations to, to pad them or extrude them to begin to make the 3D shapes. 
um, and uh, there is a rectangular hole. That's for where the, the uh, OLED display is. There are uh, two holes on the left for up down button, a hole on the right for an, an enter button. And then there is a hole where audio will come out uh, for a buzzer. Um, and uh, the, uh, this is um, kind of a proof of concept. I'm sort of hoping that uh, I'll uh, persuade the Guadalajara team to take us over and finish it so that they have a growth experience. Um, and But I did generate a, uh, a 3D file for a 3D printer, and this, this would print in about two hours' time. And assuming that the bottom enclosure, the bottom half, uh, would be uh, approximately the same volume of material, that would be another two hours to print. So it's about four hours on a hobby-grade 3D printer to make this enclosure. All right. Let's see what the next slide is. Oh. Uh, Horacio uh, Garcia um, uh, looked at our schematic and looked at uh, code that Robert had generated, and he worked up a simulation. This is a web-based simulator tool uh, called Wokui, uh, and he's wired in the display representative of how our printed circuit board works. The, uh, the, the up, down, and enter buttons laid out similar to how our printed circuit board design is laid out. Uh, and then to simulate a temperature sensor, he's got just a, a variable resistor that he slides, and that would make different values for the, the firmware to read. And uh, so that kind of will be proving out the uh, software so that when we get printed circuit assemblies, we can load that in and things will be functioning. So the Moonrat 2 stands as a beacon of hope in the fight against waterborne illnesses. Its innovative design, modularity, ruggedness, and ease of use position it as a game changer in portable incubator technology. So I am opening the floor to any questions and discussion. Thank you so much. Click one more time, Robert. While y'all are thinking of questions, um, I'd like to welcome Naram Kier from Lebanon and also uh, point out that Sylvia and Luis are here. They made it, although I don't think they're they're feeling well. Um, uh, and they've done some of the design work uh, along with uh, Orasio, who could not be here today. <laughs> So, Hi. Melanie, when is the expected arrival time of the printed circuit assemblies? December 27th. All right. So we're bringing it in uh, in, in this year. <laughs> we will hopefully turn something on this year. Uh, Melanie, how long does it usually take um, once you've placed an order to get it uh, in the United States without paying extra rush charges? About two two weeks to two and a half weeks. I see. Okay, I suspect somebody has questions, even though many of you may have heard a lot of this material before. I'm gonna wait just another 20 seconds. So this is obviously a really impressive project. Um, outside of Engineers Without Borders, is there anyone else who would uptake this and really, you know, hey, uh, start uh, using it widely? I wish I knew for sure the answer to that question. Um, I suspect there are scientists and biologists and um people that we would just call sanitation engineers and environmental engineers who would use this, but we don't know for sure. If someone watching this video has a comment about that, we would love to hear from them. 
So someone watching this video, how would they contact uh, you, Robert? Um, the public invention website at www.pubinf.org is probably the best place, uh, but you can also contact me directly. My email address is my last name, R-E-A-D dot Robert at pubinf.org or R-E-A-D dot Robert at gmail.com. So I know the first Moon Rat was published. Will this one be published again as well? Yes, we hope so. In fact, um, Melanie and Lee have started writing the draft for a Hardware X paper, um, which I, I that journal didn't exist when we published the first one. Um, and we, we, we're thinking we might be able to submit a paper to that journal, uh, which is a very good journal for open access um, scientific instruments in April. Of course, we can't. Yeah, Joshua. Joshua is the only contact I can think of who might know some people to uptake this, including the um, the uh, free sustainable. Oh gosh, there's another lab outside of Fast Research Group. Um, I can see the name. I just can't say it. The um, they do a lot of work in Africa, but. Well, there's um, the Apropedia people, too. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit, uh, Melanie, about the incubation uh, chambers and mention that there were different options for different form factors? And uh, are those things that your team is developing as well? Or is that some standard thing that you're able to leverage? Yeah. So we... um, Go ahead. Oh, no. Uh, go ahead, Melanie. So we uh, basically have, um, so, okay, you have the, the the PCB, which is the two parts of it. So you have the controller and you have the heater. We built it so that with the connector, connectors, so that it's basically, it could be expanded if you need to be, like, for instance, um, right now it's supposed to be like a small thermos or a bento box. Um, so it can like easily clip onto your backpack or maybe stuff into a tote, tote size. But we um once wanted it to be flexible enough so that it could be turned into anything, you know, any type of um, but power any type of uh, chamber. But the plan for now is just to do the uh, the three inch uh, petri films or whatever. Exactly. Got it. Is that something you're able to leverage, or is that something that you've designed? We hope to size thing. Yeah, we're, we're working on that right now. So oh. the, the larger size, the different sizes, for instance, like we looked at before talking about the test tube rack or what is it? The Petri dishes, you know, we could actually, you know, eventually make those or just have it available so somebody else can do that as well. Robert, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, the, the idea that um, of using this cable is that this cable will be all the same, no matter what incubation uh, chamber you use. So you should be able to have one controller. And if if you want to do Petri films, you use one incubation chamber, you'll just unplug it and plug in a different control incubation chamber if you want to try to incubate an entire test tube rack, which tends to be sort of... Uh, cubicle but long and skinny um, here. And so what we're trying to do is to make something versatile so it can be used for any purpose. If you see up here in the left-hand corner, you see a typical desktop incubator, which is plugged into the wall. And they're, um, they're actually, they usually cost 500 bucks. Um, they're not completely cheap, but they work great if you have reliable 110 volt power that never goes out. You, you can just use that kind of an incubator. But um, one weakness of that is that you have to get the sample back to your lab. And the, if you're in a very rural place, that can often take more than eight hours. Well, if you're dealing with a live organism, like the bacteria in water, you really can't afford to have that organism die 
and then try to measure it because you'll be telling people there is no bacteria in their water when there really is. So the World Health Organization's requirement is that you begin incubation within eight hours of collecting the sample. So for example, if you go out somewhere to a, a stream, you dip a vial in the water and take a sample of the water. You, it's your job to get that vial of water onto culture media and incubated within eight hours. And that can be very difficult to do in a small village in Guatemala, where you may be, you know, 24 hours away by truck drive uh, back to a, a laboratory. Do you, I assume you have an upper bound on the uh, power of the heater module. So I assume there's some limited size that this uh, control. So we're using uh, 12 volt batteries. Usually, although manufacturers sometimes overstate these, they're about 2,000 2, milliamp hour batteries at 12 volts. Uh, so they have they have kind of a fixed wattage. But by making the incubation chamber well insulated, preferably with a, a vacuum thermos style insulation, um, we believe that at anything um, near room temperature, you'll be able to get 48 hours in uh, which is two of those battery charges. Um, I was referring less to the battery uh, and more about the power of the heater board and its ability to actually provide the heat. Um, well, so the, what we use is these little mylar uh, heating cloths, which are, they're like miniature electric blankets, and they take power at 12 volts, and they're about, um, they have about six ohms of resistance. So you can compute how many watts that they provide, and the microcontroller switches the battery power on and off with the transistor um, to... Uh, do that. So you're, you're producing a certain number of, um, you know, watt hours or watt minutes that you're putting into this chamber. And that'll be more than enough to keep it at 37C as long as the insulation is good enough. Robert, the unit that you took to Tanzania, could you talk about the uh, uh, battery usage on it? You've had some real world experience with at least that insulator uh, thermos. Yes. So what we did was um, I charged two of those um, lithium ion battery packs that were rated. I, I don't think it was completely honest, but they claimed to be 2000 milliamp hour batteries at 12 volts. And I charged them in the United States and I carried them with me onto the plane. And of course I didn't put them in my luggage because so lithium ion batteries should be kept with you um, if you're uh, going there. And so we had them fully charged when we entered Africa. Um, and then uh, after we inoculated the Petri films and we did this, um, I, you know, I was watching it carefully. The first one lasted uh, a little more than 24 hours, and then I swapped it out because I, I didn't want to risk it running out of power before the next, um, within the next 24 hours, and I had a, a completely fresh battery. Um, it's possible that we could have recharged, and, and I did, you know, as a backup, recharge the other batteries, um, but we didn't, we didn't know for sure we were going to even have six hours of power a day uh, when we were in that village. So um, by doing it that way, we knew for sure we could do one incubation period, even if we had no electricity at all. When I, when I tested the first unit, I put it in the refrigerator and um, checked it carefully to see how many hours it would last. It would last about 12 hours uh, in the refrigerator, which of course is much colder than, than uh, a normal human being um, is at. So, you know, in the places where scientists and engineers go, it's often very cold, particularly in mountainous environments. But if they keep it with them, um, people almost always do whatever they have to do with heating or a tent or, uh, you know, other means to keep the air around them 
uh, warmer than it is inside a refrigerator. So um, we're not really expecting this to be a problem as long as as long as we build good, well insulated incubation chambers. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question. Yes, sir. Um, it looks like the um, I'm I'm seeing a lot of off the shelf parts. Is there any interest in in going further with the design and making more of the individual pieces open source? For example, like an open source um, auger plate, or an open source petri dish, or an open source um, film roll, or something like that. Well, um, that would be a different project. And we don't know about uh, demand for those things. But of course, we would applaud someone else doing that. But since it's unrelated from a design point of view, there's no reason for us to make that a part of this project. One thing with projects like this that are so impactful for health, it's hard to track the impact of it because once it's published and you have the design out there, who and how can you tell is making it? And um, knowing about it. Um, well, that's a problem. We just, uh, we probably won't know. Um, if a large number of people are using it, we will probably find out because the normal mechanism is people report bugs and feature enhancements through GitHub. And the a certain number of users uh, will be the kind of users who understand that it's an open source design and want to contribute to it. But for example, if a firm, let's say in India, chose to use this as the basis for a design and then made a uh, optimized low cost version and sold a hundred of them or 10,000 of them, uh, we would not necessarily ever be informed of that fact. So once this is is completed, could we assume that engineers without borders would use this project or they would make it themselves and use it? You know, that's a good question. I wish I could tell you for sure that they absolutely will. Engineers without borders is 95% civil engineers, not electrical engineers. They're mostly people who know about sewage pipes and how to drill wells and structural engineering and, and a few other things like that. I, I honestly believe they will not make it themselves. If we make a low cost version on our website, probably some of them will buy it. And so the strategy that Public Invention has, and I can't say it's been terribly successful now, is to make... Um, uh, short production runs of like 20 units and make it available to people to purchase just as an outreach mechanism to give people a way to test it and evaluate it, not to fill the global demand. Um, so for example, uh, someone who was thinking about making a large number of them would purchase one from us, take it apart, reverse engineer it. They'd, they'd have all the designs already because that's all open source, but they still might want to um, play with one and evaluate it and not um, go to the trouble of making it themselves. Well, I think a short production run is, you know, a fantastic service. So I'm hoping we get to see a lot of these out in the field. Yeah, I mean, you're, um, you know, you're mentioning a, a, a real 
problem in a way. Public convention doesn't make money from this. We're a 501c3 um, nonprofit. And, you know, most of the people here are volunteers who are just dedicating their time to try to make the world a better place. They deserve to, you know, be thanked and for people to know whether or not people are using their work. Unfortunately, there's no guarantee that that will happen. And there's no guarantee that people will use their work. Uh, you know, what this project is trying to do is to make a really, really good, rugged, easy to use portable incubator. And uh, I can't prove it. I just have faith that if we do that, there will be people in the world who want to use this. Certainly a small number, um, let's say maybe five teams a year at Engineers Without Borders USA, although there are other uh, nations that have their own versions of the same thing will want to use it. But that's a pretty small number of, of usages. But all over the world right now, there are people driving trucks around and bending over and taking little vials of water and analyzing them um, in a variety of ways. This, this is a very common activity and it's becoming more uh, common. So it's possible that um, I've convinced all these people to work on this project foolishly but I haven't done it dishonestly. I, I really believe this is a project that the world needs and eventually some children's lives are gonna be saved because this project made it easier to analyze water. It may take a few years for that to happen and we will never know that child's name and they'll never know that we did it. But uh, at public convention, we're willing to work on that faith. Any further questions? Any questions about the circuit or the printed circuit board? Have you gotten any feedback uh, from the people who were mentioning that it was too big or too bulky or, because uh, you had gotten field feedback in the past. Uh, have they gotten a chance to see this new version? They have not seen this new version. Um, I assume they would be happy just because they they said the old version worked fine but it was just really big to lug it around. Um, that usage occurred in Iraq about uh, eight years ago. Um, and, you know, uh, the gentleman who, who uh, did it, uh, Joshua Knight, who's a professional engineer who's, who's done an awful lot of charity work in a lot of rugged places, you know, I trust him, uh, you know, when he says that, that we need a smaller version of it. Um, but it is possible that public invention is not doing the uh, market research that it should, but we're an all volunteer organization. You know, if we had more volunteers who were skilled at that, we might uh, have more time to investigate uh, how many people would be willing to use this at a particular price point. You know, we're hoping to make it for $125, which will be you know, very inexpensive for anyone whose actual job involves collecting data. That's, it's, it's of course expensive for the people whose lives we're trying to save, the people who are drinking dirty water, hundred, we can't ask them to pay $125. But usually in most of those situations, there's some kind of professional whose job it is to at least monitor the water quality, even if they uh, can't provide water treatment. For example, in the village we're working in, in Tanzania, um, uh, they, they're they drinking untreated water directly from a river. It happens that, that uh, when I tested it, that river was approximately as clean as Barton Springs, which you're allowed to swim in here in Austin, Texas. So they're lucky in that their water is very clean. But it only would take one sick person upstream or someone to open a pig farm or something that would change that situation. And then their water wouldn't look any different, but they could have something that would make all their kids sick um, without even knowing it.
You, you mentioned a cost. What's the uh, cost driver in this application? Repeat the question, please. What's so expensive? Uh, well, I mean, we can we can lower the costs. I think uh, it's going to be fairly expensive to build the incubation chambers. Are, are they off the? Uh, maybe I missed what the incubation chambers were. I thought they were just thermos thermoses. They are just thermoses, um, but they're, they're pretty large. So they usually cost twenty to thirty dollars, um, and I guess we can make these for fifty dollars. But then you also have the battery pack, right? If you include that as as a cost, there those lithium ion batteries are fairly expensive. So. The you know the total cost might be one hundred twenty five dollars. Um, obviously, you know if you if you were going to make a large production run, if you're going to make a hundred or a thousand, the cost could you know go down very significantly. B building an incubation chamber by itself should not be expensive in a thousand units, but if you're actually three D printing it it tends to be pretty expensive. Does it have to be like a physical box like that? I mean, the reason I'm asking is that the the um, the um, the auger um, pads are flexible. So couldn't you just like stack them together in like a book or like in a roll? Um. I don't quite understand. I don't know what you mean by an auger. Um, uh, you're using auger pad. You're using um, auger either in a petri dish, or it looks like on the right hand side you've got these auger pay on paper pad um, pads over here, or the petri film, the three M petri film. Um, if you if you take that 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 idea to its logical conclusion, then we we we've invented several ways of making large volumes of films in um, flat packed and rolled um, substrates. So couldn't you just like roll them up or put them in a leaf? Well, um, so, I mean, the the media itself, are you talking about decreasing the cost of the media itself, which is expended in the incubation? Uh, I mean, partly, yes. I mean, what I'm really thinking of is like a a film roll, where the petri film is an, on a continuous roll, and so what you do is you the film roll itself would basically be a like a like your your incubator slash storage slash um, like fresh uh, petri roll, and you just iterate once, apply your your um, your sample to it, and then roll it into the petri chamber, um, with the idea that like. If the whole thing is warm, it's not that big of an issue, um, and contaminate can contaminate contaminate cross contamination may be an issue in between, um, but it's it's not the end of the world if you if you know you've got contamination, then like having a false positive is not as bad as having like a false negative. But I might have I might be a, making is assumption. high for airborne substances, especially outside of clean room, because you can contaminate it. Like even like saliva, air, water would trap bacteria, microorganisms. Also, I apologize if my environment is really loud right now or on and off. But just just saying, I think risk of contamination would be so high because there are a lot of good or bad bacteria for one part of your body and not the other. So if let's say someone had it in their saliva and that's a good bacteria, but it ended up in that water source. Would that be safe to consume for others? Or even COVID is a viral strain that can get caught as an airborne aerosol into a, a droplet form, right? And that can go into that sample too. And then someone might think, oh, why is this water carrying that microbial environment or microbial substance or organism? So having as a role that's not in a closed container and temperature controlled will affect the microorganisms that grow or die, which also affects the sample reading. But that's at least my understanding of this, which is limited. That makes sense. I was just kind of curious. Well, so, I mean, what, what you may have done is just presented another idea that could decrease the overall cost. However, we are only trying to solve one problem at a time, right? There are people who, like, so, so building 
a competitor to the three and Petrie film would be a harder project than building this incubation chamber. And that's what you're talking about, right? You're talking about making a role of your own media. Now, 3M publishes all of the ingredients that go into the gel there to biologists, the reagents that turn purple, ex-gal, the, um, the gram-positive suppressing materials. So a chemist could, in theory, do that. But that's not something public invention is particularly good at. Um, it's also the case that you still want an incubator that can work on test tube racks or glass petri dishes for the kind of biologists who are studying mycology or something else where you, you need the general purpose nature of it. So I would say that's a very good idea, but it's very different than this idea. This idea, you, you still want a portable incubator that can be applied to incubation chambers of different sizes, even if you can improve the way Petri films are used. I have a question. Do you guys have any parameterized values for what temperature controlled? I may have missed it. If, if so, please reiterate and allow me or allow, let me know. But do you guys have like any controlled limits for like what temperatures the current incubator design can meet and like what is necessary, right? As a user need? Yes. Um, so it's, so in the original design that we took to Tanzania, you could use the three buttons that are on the outside of it to set the incubation temperature. Um, Orasio has gone a bit further and has allowed the menu system to select different media. And it knows what the incubation temperature for that particular media is. That works for products, which are commercial products from 3M, where they have specified what uh, temperature you should have. Okay, so 3M makes kinds of Petri films other than E. coli detection. They detect listeria, coliform bacteria, um, I'm forgetting, it's maybe salmonella. Um, I'm forgetting the, the other ones. Each one requires a slightly different incubation temperature. Um, what Orasio did is he programmed them in, so by pushing the buttons on the menu, you can select the kind of uh, culture that you want and it sets the temperature range for you automatically. That's good, thank you. That's an example of um, the design goal of ease of use, but you know, until we build a unit and have biologists take it out into the field and use it, I'm not gonna have confidence that we have really made something easy to use, you know? The, the only way to really do that is to build a prototype that, and it has to be a prototype rugged enough to legitimately survive a trip to Iraq or a trip to Tanzania or a trip to um, Yosemite, for example. And, you know, uh, you, 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 you have to make it good enough that you can convince a scientist to risk their time using it, right? Because if they're on an expedition, let's say to some cave in Mexico, and they're going to try to culture, you know, fungus in the bottom of the cave or something, they they can't afford to have their trip ruined because it, the incubator didn't work well, right? So we, we need to make a really good portable instrument, and then we'll be able to find test users who can, um, who hopefully will give us feedback about whether it's really as easy to use as we hope it will be. Well, I do think there are some opportunities for marketing analysis and maybe uh, some some new interns and um, students who are interested in working on humanitarian projects like this. Um, 
I found a resource that exists solely to attach graduate students or undergrads in a specific um, skill set to projects that need interns in a very focused way. Um, it's uh, I think it's based out of Canada, but it involves a uh, lots of colleges and universities in North America. Great. Well, please send that to us. And anyone, I, I, I will, I will. Anyone who listens to this video, um, if you would like to help us with that, we would love to have the help. Well, I'm very proud of the team for working so hard on this project. I sponsored it on um, experiment.com. In fact, I think I was the one that told Robert about experiment.com as a fundraising source. So um, I, I just think this is a wonderful project. And um, I can imagine that there are universities and ministries of health and civil engineering organizations in very, you know, underfunded parts of the world that would be very glad to know about this project. We just don't know who those people are yet. I suspect you're right. The, the you know, once we have a prototype that we can show and to have a photograph of it and it's ready to use, I suspect we'll, we'll get more, the project will be more exciting to your average volunteer. Is there any like meeting or conference where once this is completed and or published that it could be presented as a very cool thing? Um, there's a, a biannual uh, Engineers Without Borders USA conference. There are probably many others that we don't know about. For example, I, I don't know about biology conferences, but I, I would be willing to bet there are biologists, um, including botanists and mycologists, um, who would really want to use this. Uh, but I have not taken the time to try to find those conferences. You know, the great thing about a conference as compared to a journal is you get to talk to people and you get feedback immediately. Um, public convention uses both scientific journals and conferences when when we can find a good conference uh, to to get the benefits of archival um, open source projects, which is what you get with a journal, but you get more feedback from a conference. So we, of course, do both when we can. Okay, well, maybe we should um, wrap it up here. Uh, are there any final questions? Okay, well, uh, thank you, Miriam. You can stop the recording.